Disable safety features. Maximum speed. Go. Welcome to my senior recital. My name is Josh Gunther, and I'm very excited that you are here and joining me today. Uh, I'm excited to share with you some of the music that I've worked on over the past three years, and I hope that you enjoy it. So the first piece that you just saw is called Westworld. Um, Westworld is from a film scoring competition that I did, uh, and it's from the HBO series Westworld. And in this scene, the protagonist has taken a mind-bending drug that is causing him to oscillate between two separate realities. So he's going from our reality and then he's going off into something very different. And so I tried to represent that with both acoustic elements representing the grounding here and then some of the more electronic elements to represent when he's going off into a different part of the multiverse. 
And the next piece that you're gonna see is called Turnaround. So Turnaround was composed discontinuously. Uh, I started it about two and a half years ago, and then I decided that I wanted to try and do something different because I had started it with this moody piano underscore and it just wasn't working. And I put it on the shelf and then I brought it back out again about a year ago and I wrote it with more of kind of an orchestral sense because I wanted to capture the joy and the beauty of the relationships between these students and their teachers. Um, so I hope that you'll see that and experience that um, I really enjoyed working on this. It's hard because it was five minutes long and so to capture someone's attention for that long can be difficult. I think what makes a great teaching experience for a student starts with the teacher. It's that person that you come in contact with where there is a connection, there's a rapport, that person who has taken the time to truly understand you. Whatever I teach a child or give a child will present itself when this child grows up to be a citizen of society. Kids come into the classroom completely affected by the challenges that they face at home and in the community, and it impacts the way that they learn, behave, socialize. The majority of children that we see aren't able to pay attention. They are disruptive and disengaged. I wasn't prepared to teach in this type of environment. We might not know that they don't have anywhere to live. We might not know that a parent just went to jail. When you have 29 children sitting in front of you who have emotional needs, who have more problems than an adult could handle, you can't actually teach, you can't do your job. We want to be able to reach out to those dealing with so much at home, that top 5% that's taking up a teacher's entire day. If you stop for a second and you breathe and you see what this student really is, it's a child, a baby that's in pain. You can really help them no matter how out of control they seem. When I walk into school, I feel angry. I was just a slouch in a chair. I used to walk out of class, be disrespectful, run away from my teachers. One day, my teacher sat down and talked to me about my attitude, showed me how to be a respectful person, to be a young lady that I am now. I still talk back to my teachers when I'm mad, but I listen and I am really respectful to my classmates. When I go to school, it's like a family there already like to hold me in and tell me how the day is gonna be. Turnaround for Children has given teachers a means to become more in tune with the students. It's about what can we do to get this kid on board, get them in a room and listening and learning so that they can really participate in the class that's going on. You need to be an expert in behavior, in socialization, and those are the tools and the knowledge that Turnaround provides to teachers. Having more counselors in the school, having connections with local mental health clinics has definitely given us more resources to deal with a lot of those emotional needs of our kids. I don't consider myself a new teacher, but I learned something that I could bring to my practice to make me better. It's really assisted me with setting the expectations for these children to be really high and letting them know it's attainable. I've never in my life had kids standing outside my classroom door begging to come into the class to do work. And the first time I saw that happen was when Turnaround brought the cooperative learning into our school. We help each other as colleagues. We are actually modeling what we expect the kids to do. So we are supported by Turnaround and we take that and we support each other in our classrooms. 
it's really a beautiful thing. And you can see the effects that these collaborative experiences have for students. It feels good to be that teacher that kids are gonna come to when they need help. It feels amazing. We wanna give them the foundation that they need to go far beyond what they could ever imagine. They have to have the mindset, and it starts with your belief in them. I never really got to meet my mother, so it's really like, wow, somebody like really have pride in me. If I have so much potential, I could show other people that they have it too, even though if they don't think that they got it. And I want them to see that they are somebody, just the way how everybody else thought I was somebody. So this next piece that you're gonna see um, is called, it's just a string quartet. And uh, it was one of the first things that I wrote here at Eastern. And it sounds like one of the first things that I wrote here at Eastern. Um, it starts pretty normally and then it goes off into some weird harmonic places. Um, I had very clearly just discovered chromatic medians and augmented sixths. And I was trying to incorporate that into my sound. Mostly it worked. In some places it doesn't, um, but what I like about this piece is that it just shows, for me at least, where I've come from and that I have grown in the past three years. View it through that lens and I think we'll be all good. Um, so yeah, here's my string quartet. All right, so this is called Anticipation of a Squall. It's a brass quintet, and I love brass quintets. Just writing them is a lot of fun. And, you know, if you're to look at chamber music, string quartets are very homogenous sounding. They have a very similar sound throughout all of the instruments present in the ensemble. And then you've got wind quintets, which are very um, heterogeneous throughout it all. They're very disparate between all of the instruments. And brass quintets kind of sit really well in the middle. Um, you've got different colors, you've got different timbres, but they also can blend so well together. So think about that as you listen to Anticipation of a Squall.
All right, so this next section is a suite of three different pieces for flute, clarinet, cello, cajon, and piano. Um, the first one is called 7-Eleven. Um, for all the music nerds out there, it's because it's three bars of seven eighth notes and then one bar of 11 eighth notes, which if you add them all together is the same as if I were to do four bars of 4-4. Four, four. All right, I've got all that nerdistry out of the way. Um, but basically it's kind of, it feels weird and different, but I kept how I voice things and the melodic content really continuous in order to create some balance as I'm exploring weird ways of dividing up time in music. Uh, the second piece is called Shimmering Waves. Um, it's got this repeating piano motif throughout it that's in a Lydian mode. Um, which is just, it just sounds really shimmery. It sounds floating, hence the term shimmering waves. Um, and I really like how the flute and the clarinet kind of steal lines from each other. It's almost like they're not in an argument, but in a very robust conversation, shall we say. Um, yeah, it's just very playful. And then the third piece is called Runaway Train. Um, it's just got a lot of anticipating syncopation, which gives us like, it's just a train that is on the tracks and none of the brakes are working and it's just going forward and it's not going to stop. Um, so some of the B sections of the second half um, uses shell voicings in the piano to really just amplify kind of the severity of it. And I always think of it as like a train whistle or the conductor's alarm. So you can listen for that moment as well. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy my suite for flute, clarinet, cello, cajon, and piano.
This next piece is called Stella by Starlight. So a lot happened about a year ago. I was in the pandemic and I had a lot of time to write. But one of the things that I did is like pretty much everyone else in America, I watched documentaries and I watched a documentary of Quincy Jones who was the orchestrator for like the second half of Frank Sinatra's career. And then of course he also worked um, very closely with Michael Jackson. He was his producer and kind of just like groomed him as an artist, created the artist that he was. Um, one thing that I really loved from that documentary was how he took strings and he put them together with big band and he created this beautiful lush sound that is very different from a symphony and like philosophically is also more American sounding, if that makes any sense. And so I was inspired by that. I wanted to try it and just see if I could do anything with that sound. So that was the inspiration behind Stella by Starlight. All right, intertwined. We are back to weird, unconventional instrumentation. It's got clarinet, it's got bass clarinet, it's got flugelhorn, it's got bass trombone. Um, yeah, I just wanted to write something that didn't fit kind of typical forms. And all of these parts are very interlocked and interweaved together. Without one or the other, they wouldn't make sense. Um, you need all four parts in order to communicate the melodic ideas that I have. Um, it's actually very similar to a hocket, um, which was this idea from medieval times where they would take a melody and divide it across different parts. And so that was also part of this um, inspiration for this. So I hope you enjoy and you can see some of those thoughts and inspirations in Intertwined. Thank you. 
Robots. That's the name of this next piece. Very creative. You'll see why. Um, and it's a commercial. It's a very short commercial. I really like writing for commercials. Some people don't. But what I like about it is the challenge of having to translate a company's message, doing it really quickly, doing it without distraction, or detracting from the statement that they're trying to communicate. Um, yeah, and you know, the challenge is usually you've got 30 seconds to do it. So how can you do it quick? Uh, in this piece, the syncopated groove grabs you really quickly, keeps the energy throughout the whole piece until the most important point, or at least what I think is the most important point, and then it just drops out entirely before coming right back in. And so the other thing was matching the aesthetic, and so I used a really metallic industrial sound scape. So here's Robots. <laughs> Create in me, Psalm 51. Uh, choral music does not come naturally to me at all, like at all. I sit down, I try and write it, it doesn't work. And so this semester I was determined I'm gonna write a choral piece. And this is what happened. Uh, it's inspired by Psalm 51, which of course is written by David after he's committed a multitude of sins, he's been found out and uh, He's repenting to God. That's He's asking, create a new spirit in me. Um, play, sorry, put a right spirit within me, creating a clean heart in me, oh God. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, he's committed adultery. He murdered his new wife's husband. Um, and then he's only really repented after he's been found out by Nathan. Like it's if you were to look at it face value and in how we view people today, he was not a good guy. He was not a man after God's own heart. Um, but I think that's the most captivating part of David and the story of David, that it's really not about him and his actions. It's all about God's grace. And the beauty of this moment and the beauty of it all is that he screwed everything up. And yet God still met him. God still forgave him. God still showed him grace. And, and he ended up, you know, taking him on to be this incredibly successful king who not only was successful, like, physically and financially, um, but he was also then chosen to be part of the line that eventually birthed the true king of Israel, Jesus. Um, there's redemption in this story, despite what he did despite his flaws. And um, yeah, I'm just constantly amazed by God's grace. And I wanted to try and capture some of that in here as well. Special thank you. Um, I just don't want to forget this. Special thanks to Christine Carey because she really helped me record this. And we did it in about a day and a half. Actually, we did it in a day. And uh, I'm just really thankful for her, um, especially for everything she's done this year. But this was a really cool thing that we got to collaborate on. So thank you, Christine.
All right, so this song is a little bit different, uh, and it's different because of how meaningful it is both to me and to my family. Uh, you probably don't know this, but my brother and my sister-in-law had a miscarriage last summer, and Nika and I were very thankful to be out there with them in Canada um, when it happened, um, but it was tough. It was really tough to walk through that and to see it to to walk through that with them. Um, but a couple of days after they had this miscarriage, um, we were over at their house and Emily, my sister-in-law, we were sitting on the couch and over top of her was this letter board and it said, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And it doesn't normally happen to me, but I, I believe I heard like a, a voice and I believe it was God and and it just said, you need to write a song about it. And so I did some more research. I read it. I figured out it was from Isaiah 43. And I, I did some more background research and, and realized it was about the Israelites while they were in captivity in Babylon and, and being oppressed and wanting to go back to their homeland, but not being able to yet. And uh, I just wanted to really write about that because I think it's something that a lot of people can can resonate with. What I love most about this verse and these verses is that God never denies the pain of the Israelites. He's fully aware of that, but his promise to them is, I will walk with you through that. I will, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Um, you know, he's not denying it. He's just asking that they turn their eyes upwards. So with that in mind, here it is when you pass through the waters. Quick little side note that will be vitally important for you to understand the next six and a half minutes. Um, my brother and my sister actually had a child about a month ago. And so her name is Renly Marie. She is perfect. I can't wait to see her and meet her again. Um, we're very excited and um, obviously very grateful to God, and uh, we've taken a lot of photos, as you're about to see. So for real, here is When You Pass Through the Waters. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And the river shall not overwhelm you When you pass through fire You shall not be burned And the flame shall not consume you And the flame shall not consume you for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Bring my sons and my daughters from the ends of the earth. May my children be gathered for my glory. For Apart from me, who is your Savior? Apart from me, who is your Savior? For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of The Holy 
Here's the last song, over and over. I had one intention in writing this, just make a pop song. Um, there's beautiful, beautiful simplicity in pop music, but you kind of are towing the line because if you go too simple, it can sound like sickly sweet, like saccharin, or if you go the other side, well, then it's just not really pop music anymore. So you're always kind of trying to balance that. Um, but what I really like about this song in particular is the message it's really about this couple figuratively and literally, and it's mostly autobiographical about Nika and I, but it's about constant rediscovery. And I think most people can relate to that. You've got these moments where you discover something new about someone that you've known and loved for such a long time. Uh, and it's just that process of discovery that allows us to see each other in a new light and to keep choosing each other. And I find that to be a really beautiful thought. Uh, there's countless moments where I've leaned over to Nika and for no reason just said, I love you. You know that, right? And she usually just rolls her eyes at me, but she smiles. And I don't know, when I listen to this song, I think about those moments. So maybe think about a moment for you where you're impacted by people that you love. <laughs> We've been driving for hours And we're still stuck in the rain Looking for someone else I've got only myself to blame Because over and over You find a way to my heart No pain and no sorrow Will ever take me from this love Ever take me from
dark in your day Anxious, tired, and overwhelmed Love and light the way Because over All right, well, if you've made it this far, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting me. Um, it means so much. Um, my goal with music is to impact people and also to glorify God. And so if I've done that today, then I've accomplished what I've set out to do. I have a few acknowledgments to read, um, mostly because I don't want to forget anybody. So here we go. Thank you to my wife, Nika. Thank you for bringing light and joy into my life. Thank you for your support, both noticed and unnoticed. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for being my second pair of eyes and second pair of ears, and giving me your unvarnished opinion and insight, um, and also your incredible amounts of encouragement and support. And <laughs> when I'm very angry about some technology piece that's not working, um, I'm just thankful that you're willing to hear me out and you're willing to set me straight if I'm not in the right headspace, and I just love you so much, so thank you. Uh, thank you to my family, thank you to my friends. You believed in me, you supported my dreams, and you pushed me to pursue what I was meant to do, not what I am supposed to do. Thank you to my music teachers, from Mrs. Castor and Mrs. Enns, my first piano teachers, to my high school teachers, uh, to all of my teachers here at Eastern, you shaped and molded my musical understanding and sensibilities. Thank you for pulling and pushing me into the musician and composer that I am today. Special thanks to Dr. Ford and Dr. Jakubowski. Your wisdom, insight, and friendship are immeasurable, and I treasure them deeply. Most importantly, I want to thank God, the creator of all, and the master orchestrator. Um, without him, without Jesus, without... Jesus' death and resurrection, all of this around us would be meaningless. Um, all beauty, it just, it fades in light of the gospel. It fades in light of what we are designed to do. And we are found most clearly when we are satisfied in him. And that's my desire all the time, to write and to bring glory to God in what I do. So again, I hope I did that today, but... Again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. Um, and I hope you have a good day. And I just, I'll see you later. See ya.